uh, welcome you, some of you for the second time, uh, to the second annual Capital City Constitution Day Gala uh, and the first nationwide Constitution Day celebration of which we are we're aware. Uh, we welcome those who are with us here in the room in Washington, D.C. We are at the Madison Building um, uh, near the U.S. Capitol, in fact, inside of the, inside of the Capitol. Uh, we also welcome the many law students who are joining us and others who are watching uh, the webcast and cable that we're transmitting tonight. Um, and we have groups extending throughout the country, from the east to west coast to the north uh, and from the north to the southern part of the country. We welcome all of you here tonight. Uh, the purposes of tonight's event are, number one, to celebrate the efforts of the 55 delegates who developed the Constitution and, for the most part, signed it 223 years ago, uh, and, se and second, to consider together the implications of that document and the debate that it spawned and its history uh, for some of the issues that we face today as a nation. Uh, helping the public understand and appreciate that history is one of the main purposes of Consource. And for those who aren't already familiar with Consource, I won't give you an infomercial, uh, but I'll simply tell you that its mission is to create a comprehensive, free, online repository of all the historical materials underlying the creation of our federal constitution uh, and the amendments to that constitution. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from two top constitutional scholars and historians, Walter Dellinger and Paul Clement, uh, who will be introduced in just a moment. But first, um, let me invite you, you who are watching remotely to write down an email address to which you can email us questions, and, and those questions will then be presented uh, to our speakers at the end of their remarks. Uh, the email address is constitutionday2010 at consource.org. Again, constitutionday2010 at consource.org. And those of you who are in the audience, if you want to put that number in your BlackBerry, you're welcome to email us questions too, although we'll have another way for you to get us questions. We have cards on your tables, and if you have a question that you would like to ask our presenters, write the question down on your card and, uh, and pass it up to the front of the room, and we will, uh, we will ask the presenters your questions. Uh, when you email us or send us your card, please also indicate your name and your affiliation. And again, the email address is constitutionday2010 at consource.com. Uh, let me now introduce Randy Milch, who will offer some comments on tonight's event, uh, and will also introduce our two speakers. Uh, Randy is the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of Verizon. Uh, he leads the company's legal, regulatory, and security groups. Uh, he began his legal career as a law clerk to Clement F. Hainsworth uh, of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. He holds a JD degree from New York University Law School and a BA from Yale University. Uh, he and his wife, Amelia Saltzman, have two children. And Randy's most important qualification for the event tonight is that he has a tremendous passion for the Constitution and its history. Randy? Good evening. It's very fitting that we meet here tonight at the Madison, the James Madison building uh, to celebrate Constitution Day, and I'm very honored to kick off the presentations of our two distinguished speakers. But first, uh, I think it's important that we thank Gene Scher for his inspired leadership of Consource and for his dedication to making Constitution Day and this particular celebration of it an ever more important event. Because of Gene's leadership, this evening we welcome an expanded group of attendees in this stunning setting in Washington. We enjoy the added support of the American Constitution Society and the Federalist Society, which have sponsored events for their student members uh, in 20 law schools across the country and who now join us by webcast. And we have tonight two distinguished constitutionalists and former solicitors general, Walter Dellinger and Paul Clement, for our intellectual dessert. So please join me in a round of applause for Gene. I do want to note that the joint support for this gala by the Federalist Society and ACS I think is a particularly potent symbol for this evening. The idea that these two fine organizations are the deepest of enemies is way off the mark. It's love. It's not enmity that animates their differences. It's a common devotion to the Constitution that leads them both to celebrate this day across the country. 
And that devotion, which brings us all here tonight, is, I would suggest to you, exceedingly well-deserved. One only need be a poor student of history to recognize the exceptional success that our constitutional form of government has had in binding us together across nearly three centuries of blinding societal and technological changes. As President Obama said in the Constitution Day, Constitution Day proclamation he issued, in the United States, our Constitution is not simply words written on aging parchment, but a foundation of government, a protector of liberties, and a guarantee that we are all free to shape our own destiny. And in a nutshell, that's why Verizon is strongly supported this event. In the spirit of American optimism and belief in the power of its people, Verizon is an investor in the future. Consource is an example of the happy meeting of education and technology. Thinkfinity.org, the foremost website for K through 12 educational resources and a signature product project of the Verizon Foundation, is another such example. Thinkfinity uses technology to bring learning to life, to make it immediate, relevant, and understandable to today's student, all powered by the latest technology and innovation from Verizon. I want to take a minute to salute every teacher in the audience tonight and across the nation who are here uh, via broadcast. We at Verizon are committed to helping you do your work, which we believe is critical to the future of each of your students and to the country as a whole. And I want to thank you again for your dedication. Now let me turn to the speakers. Those of you in the room have Walter Delliger's and Paul Clement's resumes in your programs. Um, I will take a moment for the benefit of those across the country to describe some of their unassailably impressive credentials and achievements. Uh, suffice it to say that Walter, who I have known since the uh, late 80s, when we sat across the table from I was I was much younger then. He's, he's exactly, no, he's much younger too. Um, <laughs> is chair of the appellate practice at O'Melveny & Myers, a, a one of our leading law firms, uh, where he heads the O'Melveny Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Cl Clinic at Harvard, and he's a visiting professor at Harvard. He's on leave from his professorship at Duke. Uh, critically for our purposes, he was the acting Solicitor General for the 96 and 97 term of the U.S. Supreme Court, where he argued nine cases that term. Uh, he has since uh, been a foremost practitioner uh, in the bar at the Supreme Court as well. Paul Clement is a partner at the Washington office of King and Spaulding, uh, and he heads the firm's national appellate practice there. He served as the 43rd Solicitor General of the United States from June 2005 to June 2008. Uh, he was acting Solicitor General for nearly a year and the principal deputy Solicitor General. Basically, every Solicitor General job he's had. I mean, I think it's just, you know, he ran right through the office. Um, his more than seven years in that office is the longest period of continuous service in the office by a Solicitor General since the 19th century. So suffice it to say, as far as the Constitution goes, both Walter and Paul are at the front rank as public servants, as private practitioners, as scholars, and as professors. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, it's always a joy to have very smart people think about really hard problems and then explain them clearly and concisely. So no pressure, guys. But Walter, it's to you. Thank you very much. But before Walter speaks, uh, not once and not twice, but three times, I gave you the wrong email address for your questions. So I have to correct that. It's uh, Constitution Day 2010 at consource.org, not consource.com. If you use the com, they won't get to us, so use org instead. Thank you. Imagine what it was like 223 years ago tonight in Philadelphia, September 16th, 1787. After the work of each day's convention, they repaired for drinks and dinner at one of the many tabards and inns to live in Philadelphia. They knew that the next morning they were going to gather 
and sign the Constitution, each one by name, in the order of states, not alphabetically, but starting, if you look at the original Constitution, with New Hampshire and Maine, and going down through New York and Pennsylvania, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, in geographical order. So that the Constitution literally is a picture of the United States. That night, 223 years ago, September 16th, they did not know how the Constitution was going to be received. They did not know. It had been drafted in secret. They sealed the windows, even in the heat of the sweltering Philadelphia summer, so as to avoid eavesdropping. They did not know how the proposal, far more dramatic than anything anyone had conceived four months earlier when they gathered in Philadelphia, they did not know how it was to be received. In fact, it produced one of the most extraordinarily divisive and bitter political campaigns in American history. But on the evening of September 16th, at least they thought it's amazing that we are where we are tonight. They would not have thought that earlier in the summer, say, July 5th, when they returned from the first and only break the convention took for Fourth of July weekend. Even as early as 1787, they celebrated that day 11 years earlier when they jointly declared their independence from England. They thought it important to recognize the 4th of July by taking that first break of the summer. When they returned, they did not do so with any optimism. The convention threatened to break apart. And as they returned on that day, we learn, and you can now learn from consource, you can look it up, you can see it easily. But to go to the debates of July 5th, as recounted by James Madison, he kept a seat close to the front. And while others went and drank, he spent the early evening recording and filling in exactly what he had learned, close to where he could hear everything that passed with the presiding officer. His account are most valuable, but by no means the only notes of the convention. What does Madison tell us about what happened on July the 5th when they returned? Governor Morris of Pennsylvania addressed the convention as follows as Madison recounts it. He came here as a representative of America. He flattered himself. He came here in some degree as a representative of the whole human race. For the whole human race will be affected by the proceedings of the convention. The country must be united, he said. If persuasion does not unite it, the sword will. He begged that this consideration might have its due weight. The scenes of horror attending civil commotion cannot be described, and the continuance of them will be worse than the term of their continuance. The conclusion of them will be worse than the term of their continuance. The stronger party will then make traitors of the weaker and the gallows and the halter will finish the work of the sword. The stronger party will make traitors of the weaker, and the gallows and the halter will finish the work of the sword. This was an extraordinarily apocalyptic vision, and yet not a single delegate rose 
to suggest that it was an exaggeration. We were two years shy of where the revolutionary spirit in France, a much older and more stable country, experienced the guillotine finishing the work of the revolution. Not a single member dissented from the notion that this was a fair vision of what might happen were they not to reach some accommodation on a new proposal. The framers who met in Philadelphia were moved not only by such apocalyptic fears, but by hopes as well, and by visions of the grandeur and importance of America. For seven years, I had the extraordinarily wonderful experience of teaching constitutional history with the late John Hope Franklin and with New Deal historian William Luchtenberg, and my third of the year was to review the work of the Constitutional Convention as reflected in Madison's daily notes, beginning with the first day, May 25th, and continuing day by day, draft by draft, through the Philadelphia summer until the convention finally rose on September 17th. And to do that with a group of students, to go through the daily debates as recounted by Madison, was to enter into another time and place, to gain a sense clouded, obscure, partial, to be sure, but a sense, nonetheless, of a truly extraordinary event in human history. A study of the unfolding architecture of the Constitution from that summer in Philadelphia exposes the reader to statecraft of the highest order. One sees in the records of what they call the Grand Federal Convention, political debate of a quality that leaves one profoundly embarrassed by the comparative poverty of the public discourse of our own generation. The work produced during those four months is a constitution whose writ yet runs and reaches now from the Montpelier Room at the Library of Congress to the Arctic Range of Alaska. The convention was the work of men who even in their own time were seen as unusually gifted. The French Charche d'Affaires wrote home to his government as the meeting in Philadelphia convened and said, if all the delegates named for this convention at Philadelphia are present, we will never have seen, even in Europe, an assembly more respectable for the talents, knowledge, disinterestedness and patriotism of those who compose it. Their work has lasted longer and served better as a foundation for free government than any constitution ever writ. And yet, and yet, there was reason for apprehension on the night of September 16th. Good reason. Because when the Constitution was first revealed to the public, forwarded to the governors of each state to be submitted to state conventions, not to the organs of state government, not to the state legislatures, but to conventions elected expressly for the purpose of approval or rejection, when the Constitution was revealed and sent forth to these conventions of the people for ratification or rejection, it produced perhaps the second most savage and decisive contest in American history. It was at first defeated in North Carolina, and it passed by only a handful of votes in the absolutely critical states of Virginia, New York, and Massachusetts, states in which supporters of ratification had to literally come from behind to win ratification by votes on the order of 89 to 78 in Virginia, 30 to 27 in New York, to those of us who are accustomed to celebrations such as this and to the subsequent sanctification of the Constitution, the question arises, what did the opponent see that was so wrong with the Constitution? And I think if we are to continue to vitalize our constitutional tradition, it's important to not only celebrate the virtues, 
and the arguments of those who drafted and supported the Constitution, but to listen as well to the voices of those who opposed the Constitution and very nearly succeeded in defeating it. And more importantly, we should reflect on our, by our own moral and political lights about things that were wrong as well as things that were right about our constitutional founding, even as we celebrate, as we do each year on this occasion, that which was profound, enduring, and wise. Let's think about what the issues were that disturbed the opponents of the Constitution. One was the framers' deep ambivalence about popular democracy. And by our lights, there was also concern about the founding generation's very constricted view of who counted as a person, which we will look at before uh, the evening is over. But I want to start by talking about what the, the kinds of things that cause concerns of the opponents of the Constitution are revealed in the secret debates available on consource. The secret debates of the convention, listen to early on, May 31st, 1787. They're taking up the first Virginia resolution, says the uh, operative opening draft. And the provision they're considering is a provision that provides that the House of Representatives, the lower branch of the assembly, shall be elected by the people of each state. Here is what is said about that proposal. Mr. Sherman, that would be Roger Sherman of Connecticut, opposed election by the people, insisting that it ought to be by the state legislatures. The people, he said, should have as little to do as may be about the government. They want information, and that time it meant lack. They lack information and are constantly liable to be misled. Elbridge Gary was up next. The evils we experience flow from the excess of democracy. He said he had been too Republican heretofore. He was still Republican but he had been taught by experience the danger of the leveling spirit. The author of the um, um, draft resolutions, Randolph of Virginia, observed that the general object of the convention was to provide a cure for the evils on which the states labored, that in tracing these evils to their origin, every man had found it in the turbulence and follies of democracy. Some check, therefore, was to be sought against this tendency in our government. In other words, as the great historian Gordon Wood once put it in an essay on democracy and the Constitution, democracy was the problem to which the Constitutional Convention was called to forge a remedy. And by that, they meant democracy run rampant in the populist state legislatures. The state legislatures that were adopted after the joint declaration of independence from England were the most populous bodies the world has ever known. For the first time, yeoman, farmers, small mechanics could participate in government. When you threw over the established order, everyone that had a musket had a right to have a say in the government that ensued. To those who were used to the long history of colonial rule in which American elites had had a substantial degree of self-government, they were appalled by this. Men who are not competent to cobble a shoe are now cobbling our laws, said Watt. So that this democracy run rampant in the state legislatures, they had very populist governments, weak governors, legislatures elected for one year terms, instructed delegates recalled, 
very populist government. Trial by jury was sacrosanct because the people themselves decided whether to apply the law. They believed that the ideal was the England, New England town meeting, and that any kind of representative government was a practical necessity but a falling away. The framers saw this as a great threat, a great threat to what Madison was to call men's unequal capacity for acquiring property, to have this kind of populist government. When the framers gathered in Philadelphia, a rumor spread, don't believe it was true, but a rumor spread that the Rhode Island legislature, which was the most populist, was considering a law that would require the equal redistribution of property every 13 years. And that was the kind of democracy in the state legislatures that caused the convening of a constitutional convention to have a government that was not so immediately responsive to popular concern. Now, does it does that mean that expression of concern about populist democracy mean that the convention was a gathering of elites who were designed to suppress the democratic will? Not really, because for, let's remember this. Those who opposed election of the House of Representatives by the people were defeated at the convention by arguments like those of James Madison. Madison said he was in favor of filtering the popular view through a more complex government, through uh, representativeness, through some mediation. But Madison considered the popular, Madison strongly urged the convention to adopt the proposal over these objections for election of the House of Representatives by the people. Mr. Madison, he referred to himself charmingly in the third person in his own notes. Mr. Madison considered the popular election of one branch of the national legislature as essential to any plan of free government. If the first branch of the legislature should be elected by the state legislatures and the second branch, the Senate, elected by the first branch, and the executive by the second together with the first, and appointments again made for subordinate purposes by the executive, the people would be lost sight of altogether. And the necessary sympathy between them and their rulers and officers so too little felt. He was an advocate for the policy of refining the popular appointments by successive filtrations, but thought it might be pushed too far. He thought that the great fabric to be raised, this new national government, the great fabric to be raised would be more stable and durable if it should rest on the solid foundation of the people themselves than if it should stand merely on the pillars of the state legislatures, and he prevailed. He wanted a national government that at least in one house rested directly on the people. And in the most critical vote, in spite of their concerns about rampant popular democracy, they were persuaded by Madison's argument that the great pillar of the national government should rest on the people themselves and one branch of the legislature should be elected directly by the people. That was a critical moment where the elites agreed that a populist legitimacy was absolutely essential to the plan of government. The, um, if there's a unifying theme to the Constitutional Convention, it is the quest to find remedies for the threat of tyranny by legislative majorities. To Madison and those who supported adoption of the Constitution, one of its great advantages was that it replaced the simple, much more direct democracy in the states with an overarching complex government, national in scope, that provided for a filtration of popular views through men of supposedly greater learning and sophistication. In our own time, many are likely to respond with some sympathy to the arguments of the opponents of the Constitution. 
Those like Willie Jones in North Carolina, Melanchthon Smith in New York, Patrick Henry in Virginia, patriots too, but largely lost to history because they're losers. Now we remember, we don't remember Willie Jones or Melanchthon Smith, we remember Patrick Henry, but that was because of a quip he made about livery and death during the revolution, not because of his opposition to the Constitution. Patrick Henry spoke for seven hours on the first day of the Virginia Ratifying Convention against the uh, ratification of the Constitution. And he spent his most eloquent pain, the first hour is spent on the first three words, we the people. We the people of the United States, it begins. Who, how dare they speak of we the people of the United States? They should have said we the states. Their charge was given by the states to propose amendments to the Articles of Confederation, which would be, if approved by all of the state legislatures, would be amendments, and they threw out, and, and only went unanimously approved by the legislatures. And they revolted. They acted unlawfully. They said this new constitution shall go into effect when it's approved by seven conventions. They've completely set aside the government of the states and rested this directly on the people themselves, and that was a reason to oppose it. And also how annual elections were one of the things that those who created state governments loved the most. Every year there was a new legislature, every year. And recall within the year. Not only that, very numerous legislatures, hundreds, hundreds in Massachusetts, so that every legislator represented a small group of friends and neighbors. There were th over 3,000 state legislators from whom power was being taken by this proposed constitution. And it was being put in a House, a Senate, at most of 26 members, and a House of 65. And therefore, each district would be enormous in scope. The opponent said, the only people who will be elected from a large district are the people of notable accomplishments. Only the great and worthy will be represented. Madison and Melanchthon Smith used almost the same phrase. Madison said, this government will be done by the notable and the worthy. Melanchthon Smith feared it would fall into the hands of the great and the worthy. They both understood that this was a government where there were a large district, only 65 people would be in the House of Representatives, 26 in the Senate. The House would be elected for two years, which was a very long time, instead of annual elections. And the Senate for six. And the President by some complex arrangement that no populist movement could any year overturn what happened. The people's immediate will would be lost sight of. For Madison, that was the virtue. For the opponents, that was the vice. The supporters said, this will give us the kind of government that will make America a great and mighty empire till the memory of man runneth not to the contrary. Patrick Henry said, why do we want to be a great and mighty empire? Why is that our ambition? We wanted virtue, small government, close to the people. Why be a great and mighty empire? It was a huge battle. And those who supported an overarching national government won, but barely. And you know what? The debate kept on going. And, it, and we hear reverberations uh, to this very, very, very day. I want to say less rather than more. And what I want to say is how shocking the Constitution was that was revealed tomorrow morning, September 17, 1787. 
the coming together of the American colonies into a single nation is more difficult than we can easily now imagine. From that earlier time, a decade earlier, at the First Continental Congress, where they jointly declared their separation from England, John Adams wrote home to the remarkable Abigail and said, quote, we are 50 gentlemen meeting together, all strangers, not acquainted with each other's language, ideas, views, designs, language, were the accents that different? Not acquainted with each other's language, ideas, views, design. We are therefore fearful of each other, jealous, timid, skittish. To us, they gathered to initiate a history. They saw themselves as defenders of a history accomplished. There had been 200 years of increasing self-rule on the American continent. One of the delegates from Virginia was the fifth generation to serve in the Virginia House of Delegates. They saw themselves as defenders of histories accomplished. They had been more trading rivals then partners, London was the hub. Spokes went out to the colonies. They competed with each other. They fought the war as allies, not as a union. They didn't even have uniform uniforms. Each colony had its own, contributed its own regiment. And they confederated under a system that required unanimous consent after the successful conclusion of the Revolutionary War. They confederated under a system that the central government, quote unquote, couldn't di operate directly on individuals. It had no more than the United Nations can pass laws binding directly on individuals. The only power to raise funds for the, quote, national government, which had no executive, was by requisitions, which is a fancy word for begging and so that was a loose confederation where each colony become a state, preserved its independence. Jeff Washington wrote, we are fast verging to anarchy and chaos. The Spanish occupied much of Florida, the French a lot of the Mississippi. The country could not maintain its own territorial integrity and that was what caused the gathering in Philadelphia. But how stunning it was the morning after September 17th to see that from this uneasy alliance of simple state governments, the framers had forged a national government continental in scope with the authority not only to create its own standing armies, but to operate directly on individuals, to regulate commerce, and for the first time to impose taxes directly on individuals. They created a constitution that unmistakably made this powerful new national government supreme and said so in terms unmistakable and addressed directly to state court judges who would be on oath to support it. Quote, this constitution and the laws of the United States made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land and judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the constitutional laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. This Federalist Nationalist vision, this Nationalist triumph was best expressed by John Marshall two decades later in McCulloch where he imagined that throughout this vast republic from the St. Croix to the Gulf of Mexico, revenue is to be collected and expended, armies are to be marched and supported. To this end, the sword and the purse, all the external relations and no inconsiderable portion of the industry of the nation are entrusted to its government. John Marshall had been aide de camp to George Washington at Valley Forge when states would not supply the money for the blankets because they said, Delaware would say Rhode Island has to send its money and we're not sending our money in. That was his searing early professional experience was with George Washington. So what you saw at Philadelphia was the nationalist triumph. And then when it's released, the concern of the states that it speaks the terms of we the people of the United States and gives us extraordinary power over the national government. Now, there was this one awful compromise. The Constitution simply didn't 
deal with slavery in terms of making things better. They made it worse. With the new Constitution, for the very first time, and this was an issue in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention uh, that was fiercely debated, for the very first time, the states of the North committed themselves to enforce slavery. Under the Articles of Confederation, under the colonies, non-slave states had no obligation to return fugitives from, slave, from slavery. By the new Constitution, the northern states bound themselves to return persons escaping from an obligation of service or labor. That's the original sin of the Constitution. For the first time, they became complicit in the enforcement of the system of slavery. It did not, it did not um, uh, sort of sneak upon an unsuspecting convention. Governor Morris condemned it in, uh, uh, after it was the, sh the shadow issue uh, throughout the summer. Uh, 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 Governor Morris condemned it as the curse of heaven and said that it was unspeakable that the northern states were to sacrifice every principle of right, every impulse of humanity to bind themselves to march their militia for the defense of the southern states against those very slaves of whom they complain, that was the notion of great, great complicity. Now, however, where does that leave us? First of all, on the question of democracy. Both sides recognized that the acceptance of the Constitution was going to depend upon the consent of the governed. Whether you wanted a more filtrated kind of democracy or a more direct democracy, both sides knew they were campaigning. And in elections, to elect people to the state ratifying conventions that had the widest expanse of the franchise the world had ever known, they were campaigning for the consent of the governed. And the supporters of the Constitution were arguing for a more filtrated, a more Burkean form of government one that had more protections against majoritarianism, more of a national government that would be a check against local prejudices. And in adopting a national constitution based upon the notion of the dignity of each individual, the notion of rights that underlies the constitution was literally at war with the institution of slavery, literally at war with it in a very uh, direct sense that federal juries were going to acquit people accused of freeing fugitive slaves. And once you had rights under the Bill of Rights that applied to free persons of color, you had a system of a Bill of Rights, a whole system of the notion of the rights of man that was literally at war, uh, a notion that Lincoln could draw upon in arguing that the better meaning of an aspirational constitution was at war with slavery, which was only grudgingly accepted. Finally, it created a national government that has had some measure of success. It created a strong national government, and what has that government done? It settled the vast continent. It marshaled a million people in arms and suffered hundreds of thousands of deaths to end slavery. It turned back the greatest economic depression the world has ever known. It helped liberate Europe from the scourge of Nazism, and it won the Cold War. That is no small list of achievements for the government that was created by the document that was released on September 17, 1787. Thank you. I was asked to respond to Walter's remarks, and when I was first asked that, I gladly accepted, but I knew I had a problem, which is I almost always agree with Walter, and tonight's no exception. I mean, his comments about the revolutionary character of the document that was unleashed tomorrow, uh, his discussion of its major flaw, his discussion of uh, 
what's been accomplished under that document were, were, were inspiring. And so I knew they would be. So I didn't really plan on responding directly. Um, and I figured I'd make sure I didn't respond directly by tackling a different issue and really fast forwarding about six years. But Walter talked about the slavery issue, uh, something specifically addressed by the Constitution. But if you were going to quibble with the Constitution, and it's only a quibble, you would also want to think about what are the issues that the Constitution didn't address directly, the answers it didn't provide directly. And of course, famously, one of the things that it doesn't address with explicit clarity is the whole notion of judicial review. And because it doesn't address judicial review, it certainly doesn't answer the question, how should one go about interpreting the Constitution? How, what sources are relevant? Uh, what method of interpretation? You know, the, the framers didn't tell us that there's going to be these Federalist Papers and you should pay particular attention to them. All of those issues are really not addressed directly by the constitutional document itself. And fast forward to today, and there remains a very lively debate on the Supreme Court of the United States as to how best to interpret the Constitution of the United States. Now this is pretty obvious to anybody who's familiar with the Supreme Court. You can tell it from a 5-4 decision where two people, sometimes looking at similar sources, come out very differently. Sometimes they come out differently because they find different sources relevant. But really maybe where it's most obvious is when you have one of those lovely 2-2-1-4 decisions where justices that actually agree with each other on the bottom line come at it from very different ways, or very different modes of analysis. And if any of this was going to be lost on anybody, even the slowest learners among us could understand there's a division of authority on the court as to how to interpret the Constitution. Because two sitting justices have written two books on how to interpret the Constitution. And one of them is directly styled as an answer to the other. So Justice Scalia writes a book called A Matter of Interpretation, where he espouses what I would loosely describe uh, as a textualist or an originalist way of interpreting the Constitution. And Justice Scalia would tell you in his own words what that means is that he's focused on discerning the original meaning of the text, which he adds is not the same thing as what the original draftsman intended. It's what the original readers essentially understood that the words meant, what they were ratifying meant. So Justice Scalia is focused on the text. He's focused on its original meaning. Justice, Justice Breyer, on the other hand, has written a book called Ordered Liberty, where he espouses a much more holistic mode of interpreting the Constitution. He's going to look not just to the text, though he certainly thinks that important, not just to original meaning, but also to things like the purposes, the consequences. Uh, he does care what the original draftsman intended by the words, not just what the words were meant to mean. So there's this division. And what I wanted to take you back to is the first, I think, great division among justices on the court in trying to interpret the Constitution. Now, you may think I'm talking about Marbury against Madison, but I'm not. I'm talking about an earlier decision and in some ways, I think one of the great decisions that cements the court's role in the public eye, uh, and certainly an interesting decision because it's the first decision of the Supreme Court to be directly responded to with an amendment to the Constitution. So I speak of Chisholm against Georgia in, in 1791. One of the very first cases that the Supreme Court heard, in a couple of the first terms that the Supreme Court had, they essentially gaveled open the session of the Supreme Court and they had no cases to hear. Not one. They gaveled the session in order, they took a recess. That's all they did, because they didn't have cases. You know, it wasn't time for the appellate cases to get there and they didn't have any original cases. But in 1793 they had a case. It actually arose the year before and they saw trouble coming so they kicked it off for a year. But in 1793 
they had to have, uh, had to hear a case that involved an effort by a citizen of one state, here a citizen of South Carolina, to try to sue another state, the state of Georgia, in the Supreme Court in an original jurisdiction. Now, everything Walter said about the sovereignty of the states coming into the Constitution would lead you to think that a citizen of another state hauling a state into court would be, not in their own courts, because they've waived their sovereign immunity, but into the United States Supreme Court would be a remarkable thing if it could happen. So why would you think that it might be able to happen? Well, because of the text of the Constitution. Here's what it says. It said that it extended the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to, quote, controversies between two or more states and between a state and citizens of another state. Well, controversies between a state and a citizen of another state. That sounds like that applies. Now, maybe what they had in mind is that a state could sue a citizen of another state and initiate the action. Maybe that's all they had in mind. But in any event, the text there seems like this suit can go forward. But, as I say, if you took a step back and thought about what had brought us to the Constitution, the nature of state sovereignty at that time, it would have seemed a pretty unthinkable thing that a citizen could haul a sovereign state into court against its will. This is the issue that the Supreme Court faces. Okay, we all know about the adversarial system of justice. The Supreme Court had a little trouble with this one because the state of Georgia, consistent with its position that the citizen of South Carolina had no business suing the great state of Georgia, didn't show up. Uh, they, sent, they sent and said a remonstrance against the suit. Um, and that's part of the reason the court carried it over. They hoped maybe somebody from Georgia would show up. They didn't. Then, in something I think any Supreme Court practitioner can really get their head around, the court did an extraordinary thing. The court literally asked in open session, will any member of the bar come and defend the position of the state of Georgia? Now, in this day where you have lawyers you know, doing cartwheels to get a Supreme Court argument, it's a little hard to imagine, but no member of the Supreme Court bar stood up. So the case was argued. Uh, on the one hand, by the Attorney General of the United States, uh, this was you know, his kind of night job. He was moonlighting. Back then, the Attorney General job was not a full-time job, so he argued on behalf of the citizen. No argument on the other side. The Supreme Court decides the case. This is before the days of martial and unanimous opinions, so the decisions are handed out seriatim. The Chief Justice calls first on Judge Iredell, and he issues his opinion, which is an opinion that, loosely speaking, I think Justice Breyer would be quite happy with. It's an opinion that looks to the broader context, to the sovereign interest of the states, to the sovereignty that predates the Constitution and suggests that surely all of that was in the framers' mind and they couldn't have meant by this provision that a citizen could haul a, a state into court. So with a more holistic interpretation, Judge Iredell says that the suit doesn't lie, we do not have jurisdiction. Then the other four justices go right down the line voting the other way in opinions that I think would make Justice Scalia pretty proud. Uh, there was a lot else said, but at the end of the day, the focus was on the text. So what happens next is a great reaction to this decision, and it wasn't favorable. Just to give you a flavor for it, Charles Warren, a great historian of the Supreme Court, remarks that the case, quote, fell upon the country with a profound shock. David Curry, a more recent great historian of the court, summarized the point by saying newspapers representing a rainbow of opinion protested what they viewed as an unexpected blow to state sovereignty. But my own favorite to capture this much more concretely is the reaction of the House of Representatives, one of those popular legislatures that Walter referred to in the state of Georgia. What they did is they passed a bill and that bill made any effort to enforce the Supreme Court's decision in Chisholm against Georgia a felony punishable by death without benefit of clergy. <laughs> now that was, you know, that was pre-incorporation, so you didn't have to worry about the Establishment Clause. It would have been a fascinating Establishment Clause decision to see whether or not that, that denying benefit of clergy was a problem. Fortunately, though, we never had to decide that issue because 
The Constitution, among its many geniuses, had a mechanism and a meaningful mechanism, unlike the Articles of Confederation, to amend the document. And the document was amended and brought with us the 11th Amendment to the Constitution. The 11th Amendment to the Constitution reads, the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed by the Supreme Court or anyone else to extend to any suit in law or equity against a, a, a state of the United States by citizens of another state. So there it is. And that process was a relatively rapid process of overturning that decision. So the one thought I would leave you with that I think is an interesting one for students of the Constitution and students of this issue about how do you interpret this great document is did the, course, did the court in Georgia, Georgia against Chisholm, Chisholm against Georgia, did the court get it right? Because on the one hand, I mean, there was a constitutional amendment reacting to the decision. So I suppose it's convenient to say, or tempting to say, well, the court blew it. I mean, clearly they got it wrong. There was a constitutional amendment that told them that's not what it meant. On the other hand, the text of the Constitution does seem to suggest, and that's what was ratified, that a citizen of a state could haul a state into court. And by that measure, the simple fact that we had to have an 11th Amendment does not condemn the decision as being wrong. And I think, in a sense, that's the debate that continues on the court to this very day. Whether it's interpreting a statute or it's interpreting the Constitution, you know, there's a temptation with the legislative issue that if the court interprets a statute a certain way and Congress responds, oh, the court got it wrong. Well, not necessarily. That may have been exactly what the statute Congress passed meant, and it may have been the best thing for democracy to prompt Congress into action. But these are the questions that were left unanswered by the Constitution. They continue today. And it's a wonderful organization here that provides us some tools to answer some of these questions. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Walter, very, and, uh, and Paul, very much for your, for your excellent remarks. Uh, we do have a, a few questions from the audience. Um, let me read the first one. Um, how can someone as smart as Walter Dellinger be so good looking? <laughs> that question came from Walter. <laughs> I had my <laughs> And actually, Walter, why don't we let you answer the question that Paul raised uh, at the end of his remarks. Um, do you think the court got it right in Chisholm? I do, and I think the court's perspective in Chisholm against Georgia was that the plain meaning of the text should not be overcome by a powerful sense of state sovereignty, which would seem to be invaded by the clear text, because I think there was a good argument at the founding that state sovereignty was extinguished by the Constitution of 1787. That's why Patrick Henry was against it. By that, I mean states were, first of all, states were bypassed in the ratification process, the existing organs of state government. Articles of Confederation said no alterations except by unanimous consent of every state legislature. They said forget that. This new Constitution, which was illegal if judged by the Articles of Confederation, when adopted by six or seven states' conventions of the people in each state shall take effect. States were stripped of the power to have foreign relations. States were stripped of the power to have to provide for the arming of their own militias. States were stripped of the power to coin money. What other attributes of sovereignty are there? So the whole notion of state sovereignty was, in a sense, an anomaly. Now, I don't mean to say that that answers all of our questions about the role of the states going forward. Because as I said, the Constitution was ratified 30 to 27, 87 to 78 in Virginia. And that sort of debate and dialogue continues on. The anti-federalists who opposed the Constitution did not give up. They insisted on a Bill of Rights, for example. They insisted on a Tenth Amendment, a Second Amendment, and other provisions to safeguard state autonomy. And they, uh, 
Those were essentially the coin that was necessary in order to gain ratification. But it was certainly a sense that the Constitution that was released on September 17th, if it did one thing, made it clear that there was one and only one sovereign. Well, thank you. Uh, let me ask you both a, an interesting question from uh, Eric Garcia, who's a student at Florida International University Law School. He, he writes asking essentially, uh, what does the history of the creation and the ratification of the Constitution have to teach us about the current issue of same-sex same marriage and whether there should be a constitutional amendment on that point? <laughs> <laughs> After you, Walter. <laughs> Well, there's a lot to be said on the issue of same-sex marriage, but I'm not sure that there's anything in the, in the founding generation that would address it. Um, I'm thinking hard and fast here. Um, I suppose that uh, as someone who supports that notion, if I were to try to come up with an argument to gain support from the founding generation, it would be that we are a nation built upon constitutional change and evolution. And that unlike countries that have very fixed systems, what is essential about American identity is that we're always and ever evolving. Uh, but that would be the best I could come up with, and I don't think that's actually particularly good. Thank you. Well, and, and, and I think it's fair to say that the original Constitution probably doesn't speak very directly to this. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously part of the debate, for example, is, okay, there is an amendment process in the Constitution. So what, what does that tell us? I mean, how much when it comes to recognizing new constitutional rights, do we want to do that through the process of amending the Constitution, through the amendment process itself? And how much do we want to have essentially judges interpreting relatively broad provisions in the Constitution in a way that may sort of sap the need or the will for the amendment? Because if you have an interpretation of the Due Process Clause that everybody thinks is pretty hunky-dory, um, well then why would you ever amend the Constitution? Because it kind of evolves uh, through various interpretations of the document. So that's one area where you might be able to uh, trace the issue. Then the other, I think, interesting issue that lurks under the surface of the same-sex marriage issue is, and I think it, it comes to right what Walter was saying um, in response to the Chisholm against Georgia question, which is, what, what, what was the residual role for the states? How much what, did the federal government take over? How much was the federal government a general government? How much was left for the states? I think there would have been a sense that at the time of the framing, to the extent the question of marriage came up in government, it would be in the state houses and not in the United States Congress. That was not one of the, certainly not one of the issues that led to the founding of the, of, of the federal <laughs> government. Um, so, you know, I do think that's another issue that kind of well, and, 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 below but, the surface. And that leads me, by way of friendly rejoinder, to talk about the fact that the 14th Amendment wasn't simply a revision or an alteration, or an amendment. The 14th Amendment fundamentally changed America. Before the 14th Amendment was adopted, the, and before the Civil War, the notion that the federal government would guarantee rights of citizens in each state against their own state government was both a ludicrous idea in theory and even more ludicrous in practice. Every state government, most state governments had a bigger budget than the national government before the Civil War. The Attorney General on the eve of the Civil War was a part-time officer who had two clerks and a messenger. After the Civil War, you built the Executive Office Building, which was unthinkable before the Civil War. It was that the Civil War was not just the largest project of the national government to that date. It was larger than every project of the national government from the beginning to the Civil War combined. And in its aftermath, they passed a constitutional amendment saying no state shall not do some certain specific things, but denied any person privileges and immunities of citizenship, deprived persons of life, liberty, or property without due process, deprived to any person within his jurisdiction equal protection of the laws, and they proposed it and, and gave Congress the authority to enforce this. This was a very revolutionary change. And done against the backdrop that 
between 1787 and 1868 and 1870, the courts had given very expansive interpretations to the power of judicial review. See Dred Scott. Uh, see, not just Never Chisholm a great example. Stories. Never a great example. <laughs> but uh, Fletcher against Peck. Uh, the federal courts had asserted great authority to interpret provisions of the Constitution. So the 14th Amendment was passed by Congress that knew what it was doing and ratified by the states, and that fundamentally altered the fact, and it made the federal government, for better or worse, gave it authority over the rights of citizens against their own state governments. So whether any particular application of that right is a correct one or an incorrect one is, of course, another question. But the legitimacy of the inquiry, and Randy Barnett is nodding, is no, the legitimacy of the inquiry is no longer in doubt after the adoption of the 14th Amendment. Right. No, and I'll let you get a question in, but I mean, I'll just add, you know, by way of agreement, that, you know, if you are and I think Randy Barnett would also agree with this, if you are a student of the Constitution and you think a project like Consource is important because you can learn from framing era documents, um, then you have to be a student of Reconstruction. You have yep. to understand that the 13th, the 14th, the 15th Amendments were not just, you know, like, you know, some of the other amendments. I mean, they really, were transformative, and you have to understand what the transformation was, and, and that it, the fact that they, to recognize that they are transformative does not answer the questions. It just says there are important, difficult questions to answer, and you know, I had the great privilege last term of arguing the McDonald case in the Supreme Court, and one of the reasons it was such a great pleasure is there was an opportunity, you know, it was one of the last great incorporation questions left, and it was an opportunity to really get inside the Reconstruction era history. And it really is, I think, the first and most important sources are from the framing era, but probably second is what we did in Reconstruction. For those right. of you that don't know McDonald by its name out there, Paul successfully argued in McDonald that the Second Amendment was one of the rights incorporated against state infringement uh, by the 14th Amendment, um, and that um, uh, and, and it is a consummate uh, attribute to his skills as an advocate that he persuaded the court to an erroneous decision. Next question. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and one of the implications, I, I think, of what you both just said is that when we talk about the framers of the Constitution, we, we have two sets of framers, the, fra the framers in 1787 and then the framers after the Civil War. Um, let me, on, on the issue of judicial review, we got an interesting question from Nick Purse at the J. Reuben Clark Law School who asked, do you think the founders intended that the principle of judicial review um, would exist as one of the powers of the uh, U.S. Supreme Court? Did they, did they contemplate that or was, was that a surprise to them when, uh, when, McCull when McCullough and uh, other decisions came out? Well, I, I guess my answer would be that, that the Chief Justice Marshall thought that the framers contemplated it, and that's good enough for me. Um, and, you know, his reasoning in Marbury was essentially that the notion of judicial review is implicit in a written constitution, at least one that creates a judicial branch. Um, and I think that that, you know, I think that's probably right. One of the things that is interesting to keep in mind is that although it took a little while to get Marbury, um, and you know, we could talk all night about Marbury and what a brilliant decision it was for Chief Justice Marshall to announce you know, the greatest power grab by the judiciary ever in the context of a case where the implication of saying that the court could review acts of Congress for their constitutionality was to deny the court jurisdiction, which was brilliant. So it was this act of self-abnegation at the same time, it was a huge power grab, and because they said we don't have jurisdiction, there was nothing any other branch could do about it. Brilliant, brilliant maneuver as a matter of real politique, but also, I think, right on the law. And if you look, there were decisions in the federal courts riding circuit much earlier, finding acts of Congress unconstitutional, finding state laws unconstitutional. And the framers did not leap up. I mean, the framers were still around, and they did not leap up and say, we completely didn't have that in mind. And in that sense, the 11th Amendment experience, you know, shows that 
the, you know, the framing generation was still around. They knew how to react and get a constitutional amendment passed if need be, and they didn't do it right. in any of those contexts. Yeah, the, the, the issue that arose after Marbury was whether officers of the government could be amenable to suit, any kind of suit. Not whether there was the power of the court to make its own interpretation of the Constitution and declare invalid acts of Congress that were inconsistent with the Constitution. Yes, I think Marbury was right they decided, but moreover, I think it was only one hard issue in Marbury. And that is, is the Constitution law? Is it law? Because what's clear about the Constitution is that the courts has a job to do, which is to resolve lawsuits between litigants and to apply the law to that. And when it resolves a lawsuit, a, a lawsuit between litigants, is the Constitution law, or is it like the Pledge of Allegiance or the Declaration of Independence or the Star Spangled Banner? Is it positive law invocable in court by litigants? And everything about the Constitution says that it was intended to be invoked by court in court by litigants. It speaks the spare language of command and prohibition. It, it, it doesn't read in horatory or emotive terms. It speaks as if it is commanding results. And if it's law, does it take precedence over other law that's applicable? And it tells you that it does. It's the supreme law of the land, anything is state law of the contrary notwithstanding. So I don't think there is any doubt that the framers understood that the Constitution was invocable in court by litigants and that the court would make its best judgment applying that as, as law. Now, I think that the court should confine itself to real lawsuits among real litigants. And there's some bad decisions like Flass versus Cohen on taxpayer standing where the court turns Marbury upside down. The court says, in Marbury, the court says, because we have a job to do, we have to resolve a lawsuit between two people. We have to apply the Constitution, and to apply it, we have to interpret it. That's all it says. Later cases said, well, because our job is to proclaim the meaning of the Constitution, which I don't think is their job, we have to find a lawsuit in order to do that. So I have always been a completely right-wing curmudgeon on a strict view of standing, that you, that, that you only... Uh, the court should only decide, declare what the Constitution means if it is necessary to do their job immediately in front of them, which is to resolve a lawsuit between two people who have a traditional lawsuit. Right. Let's go back to the 11th Men Amendment for just a moment. Uh, we had an interesting question from uh, J.P. Glowitz from the University of New Hampshire. He asked, how would our court system be different had the 11th Amendment never been enacted? Do you think the federal courts would be overrun with citizens trying to sue their states? Well, I, I think one thing that would have happened is that um, the Supreme Court would have had a lot busier docket in its early years and to this very day. I mean, you know, it's hard to imagine. If you could get into Supreme, to the Supreme Court of the United States in an original action um, just by virtue of suing uh, another state, I do think there'd be all sorts of those suits, and the Supreme Court would be a different animal. I mean, now, presumably something would have had to give. Um, you know, Walter talked about, you know, how certain legislatures were, uh, you know, very small districts and lots of members. You know, one of the proposals, uh, the 12, you know, we have the Bill of Rights, but there were 12 proposals, 12 proposed amendments in response to uh, the Constitution when it was enacted. The 11th of the 10 is our 27th Amendment. The one of the 12 that never made it is the one that put limits on the size of districts that would have forced sort of, you know, limits on how many people you represented, which would give us a huge House of Representatives. Now, if that had actually gone in, in, in and become, at the time, an, uh, one of the original amendments to the Constitution, I think something would have had to give. Um, you have a thousand-person house. So. Exactly. Right. And then in the same way, if, 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 if there's no 11th Amendment, something would have to give. Now, there'd have to be another court created, which was the Supreme Court Junior Varsity Division that hears original actions. Um, and that's not that exciting, but we'll, you know, do it over there, and then the Supreme Court, as we know it, would be kind of well, over here in Paul, the varsity. Isn't it the case that ex parte Young allowed you to sue state officers using state power? And that ex parte Young really took the, in a sense, the teeth out of the 11th Amendment 
it, without Ex parte Young, the 11th Amendment means you really couldn't sue the state. But Ex parte Young allowed people to sue state officers. In district court. In district, I understand. <laughs> right, it yeah, wouldn't right, be in the right, state. The Supreme right. Court has always been able to finesse the original jurisdiction of <laughs> appointment. There'd be a lively business for special masters appointed by the Supreme this Court. True. That's all. This yeah. is true. I think one, one might also question whether the 11th Amendment has much impact today in light of the fact that in statute after statute, Congress abrogates the state's uh, sovereign immunity pursuant to Section 5 of the 14th. Or tries to, and then we tries litigate to. about it. That's right. And, you know, and that's Usually been gets a, sustained. Right, but it's been a, a, a pretty fertile source of, yeah. of, of litigation in the past uh, two decades. Yeah. Well, let me ask for a round of applause for our uh, two speakers tonight. <laughs> We, we thank you both for your thoughtful remarks. Um, uh, we also want to offer our thanks to our, to our several sponsors tonight, especially the Verizon Foundation, the Ford Motor Company Fund, and a special thanks um, uh, to Ann, whose last name, I'm sorry, I can't read. Ann Quest, uh, who is the sponsor of our essay contest. Uh, let's offer them a round of applause, if we may. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Happy Constitution Day.